Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna Ralnick, the Executive Director of Content and Client Services here at the State Library of Queensland. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the ancestors who came before them. The location of State Library here on Krulpa Point was historically a significant meeting place, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people, and we proudly continue that tradition here today and tonight. As part of the State Library's fellowship program, the Middle Houses Scholar in Residence is awarded each year to a leading or emerging thinker who through their project apply evidence-based research in existing theories or policies and in doing so test new ideas and enable practical outcomes. Projects such as these contribute significantly to the development of new knowledge in the cultural sector and assist in the continuous improvement of practices here at the State Library. The award is generously funded by Do Dr. Catherine Middlehauser AM through our Queensland Library Foundation. And in 2017, the Middlehauser Scholar in Residence was awarded to Tess Maunder. Tess is a curator, writer and researcher based in, Queens in Brisbane. She is the outgoing Middlehauser Scholar in Residence at the State Library, a tutor in creative industries at the Queensland University of Technology, an editor of Absolute Humidity and has just become as the Curator Urban Arts Project in Brisbane. Tonight, Tess will be leading the discussion about how contemporary arts practices intersect with archives, how do artists approach the archive, what role does a library or repository play for artists in their practice. Please join with me in welcoming Tess. Hello everyone, thanks so much for coming along tonight. Um, thank you very much for that warm welcome um, from State Library. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land, um, elders past, present and future. And I'd also like to extend that welcome to any um, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander um, people here today. Um, yeah, so um, I was very privileged to be um, a, a fellow here with State Library. Um, looking specifically at the role of archives and how they intersect with creative practices. Um, and so tonight I have with me um, four amazing artists and we're just going to have a very broad conversation about um, the way archives, repositories, collections have a, have a relationship to artist practices because I think um, this research is all happening. This research is all going on all the time. Artists are always engaging with these ideas. But I think when we visit a place like the State Library, we aren't necessarily considering that actively. Um, so it's kind of about merging these two things, merging uh, the State Library and all of the amazing resources that are happening here, but also merging and acknowledging the amazing and rich and diverse um, arts community here in Brisbane, and particularly also looking at, at that emerging level of practice and at experimental practices as well. Um, so we're gonna have a conversation in a second. I'll move away from the podium. Um, I might, yeah, I think let's have a, let's sit down and then I'll introduce you guys because it will be a bit, be easier for everyone to identify who everyone is if we do that. So I'd like to informally invite you all to the stage. Thank you. Hello, is this working? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm joined here, like I said, uh, with some key representatives from Brisbane's emerging art community. Um, so I'll start down the far end with Sam, um, Sam Cranston, and I'm just going to read Sam's bio so I don't forget any information. Um, Sam Cranston's multidisciplinary practice combines various forms of research with a, a wide array of media to create work that investigates different systems of representation. His work regularly focuses on historical figures and events as a way of exploring how history is shaped, how it functions, and how we as spectators rely on different visual systems as a way of understanding or acknowledging our past. Um, these investigations address the importance of the role assumed by the artist in creating work, as well as the importance of popular culture mass media, art, 
architecture and design in formating a collective understanding of our environment and surroundings. Um, and just to add to that, um, you know, Sam is someone uh, who's been sort of very active in the Brisbane art community, um, as with all of the artists here tonight. And, um, you know, I had the pleasure of writing Sam's catalogue essay a few years ago, Box Copy, Artists Run Space. So it's very nice to always continue to have these engagements with artists as well. Um, now, next we have Alicia Ray. Um, so Alicia is a Japanese-Australian visual artist whose works, work draws upon her mixed heritage and lived experiences between places, cultures and communities. Her works are created from personal and historical archives which Im embed narrative and symbolism within a Japanese design aesthetic. Um, works include portraits, patterns and paper, paper cutting, which have been translated into large-scale murals and um, public art commissions. And as we're talking tonight, um, we have a fantastic um, PowerPoint behind us, which will be a rotation of all of the images. Um, so instead of just keeping it static, we're just going to keep it rolling and, you know, hopefully you guys will, um, you know, pick up on some connections between practices as well. Um, and Alicia is someone that I've also had the pleasure to work with, um, so I'm very excited to have you here again tonight. Thank you. And um, you're very, you know, contributing in many different ways to the arts community here. Um, next we have Lou Forsberg. Um, Lou is an emerging experimental artist working primarily with new media, assemblage and installation to examine the, nex the nexus between environmental, social and economic systems. For Forsberg's research focuses on the area of ecological economics, the relationship between land and capital. Their practice interrogates dominant perspectives of the Australian landscape and politics, while critiquing blind spots and dead ends in the Australian art historical canon. Most recently, their art practice has focused on the complexities of the mining industry, rehabilitation and reclaiming of mining sites and the location and site ex accessibility. Their artistic practice communicates the relentless and damaging nature of colonialization, whilst also displaying symbols of interconnectedness complicitly, com complicitly and transparency. Um, Forsberg graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts Visual Arts Honours from um, Queensland University of Technology, QUT, which is now where I'm a, a tutor, so that's very nice, um, in 2016 and has been working as a co-director of Cut Thumb Ari with um, another very um, interesting um, Brisbane-based artist, Callum McGrath, since 2015. Forsberg is an occasional curator um, and is also an emerging writer who has contributed reviews for Un Projects and Art in Australia Online. Um, I think that gives a really well-rounded approach to um, Lou's practice because, like, like we've just said, um, you know, you contribute so much to the art community and not only through your own practice but also through being very generous and writing about other people's practice and, and sort of um, contributing that conversation beyond the self which is also really important and also obviously having um, that connection to artist-run spaces which I think is, um, as we all agree, in um, the local um, art community is such a lifeblood here in Brisbane. And um, finally, closest next to me, I have Ryan Presley. Um, Ryan was born in um, 1970, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> dyslexic <laughs> moment there, sorry, a little bit younger than that, we are talking about emerging artists here today, um, in 1987 in Alice Springs. Um, his family's, father's family is um, Mar Marina and originates from the Mile River region in Northern Territory. I might get Ryan to repeat those um, so that I'm not totally bastardising them. Um, his mother's family are Scandinavian immigrants. Um, he currently lives and works in Brisbane. Um, his art practice is a reflection of his locale, which he audits and critiques. In doing so, Presley mounts a larger inquiry that interrogates articulations of power. Presley's works has, have been acquired by the University of Queensland Museum of Art, um, Murdoch University Art Collection, Griffith Artworks and the Museum of Brisbane. Um, in 2015, his essay, Debt, was published as part of the Courting Blackness, Recalibrating Knowledge in the Sandstone University's book available through Queensland um, University of Queensland Press, which was also an exhibition 
um, that happened a few years ago, which was really um, exciting and important at UQ. Um, Presley's artworks have been included in trademarkings at the Van Abbey Museum, which was literally a few months ago in April, yep, yeah. um, and in the 23rd, um, sorry, 33rd Telstra National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Awards in Darwin. Frontier Imaginaries at the IMA here in Brisbane, which Lou was also included in and we'll talk a little bit about tonight. Um, uh, Tarawara Biennale, Endless Circulation in 2016. And um, Presley has also uh, recently completed a PhD in 2016 at the Queensland College of Art just down the road and is now a postdoctoral research fellow at Griffith University. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm glad we got through the bios. Um, so the way that I really wanted tonight to focus is that um, these guys have done really rich research into um, different areas of practice. So I'm going to try and talk less and um, really hear from you guys about um, some of your projects. So I think the way to um, best approach it is that, you know, I ask you guys specifically about a project. We have a bit of a conversation about that and then, you know, hopefully there'll be some um, broader themes that will come out of that as well. Um, so, Sam, did you want to kick it off down the end? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, <coughs> so I guess, yeah, the, there's a, a project that I'm working on um, at the moment that uh, is very much... I mean, I've sort of made a lot of work in the past that deals with different um, historical narratives. I kind of get fixated on events and, and figures and sort of... Um, I fall into the bad habit of saying it's a research-based practice, but I think kind of most practices really are research base in many different ways but um, at the moment I'm working on one that's very much about a, um, uh, a Brisbane narrative um, with international elements. I've, I found out about a Greek town planner who moved to, to Brisbane in the early 1950s. Uh, he was a really fascinating figure who was involved in the Greek resistance during World War II uh, and he was a, an engineer, town planner and architect and um, so during the, the yeah, during World War Two, he was part of a, a very very well organised resistance that I think there were two hundred and fifty different engineers and town planners and and fifty were tasked with um, destroying certain roads, buildings, different kind of um, um, you know destroying infrastructure to hamper the the Nazi and Axis effort, and then the other two hundred were tasked with planning the rebuilding of post war Greece. So very much kind of you know focused on on a much broader. Um, understanding of, of um, you know what it meant to be part of a resistance. Uh, then, after that, he became a government minister for for um, a couple of years. I, I should probably say his name. Um, Constantinos Apostolos Doxiatis was his name. And so then he lost his job in a in a fairly public way and and decided that he would move to Australia. And this this was in. 1950 and decided to move to Brisbane but during the time that it took for him to actually get over here and relocate his family he had three daughters at the time with his wife Emma um, all of the job prospects that he had lined up the opportunities uh, had fallen through due to a change in in both state I think both state and federal government and so by the time he arrived here there was no work and he, he wasn't able to establish um, a practice for different different reasons and he ended up in order to support his family farming tomatoes for three years in Rochdale and that was kind of what he what he did so so I then after three years I think there was a storm that wiped out his crops and he kind of was a little bit fed up with it all and decided to move back to to Athens in 1953 um, and within you know 10 years of him moving back he was basically um, a, almost a, I mean, at this point, he's sort of almost a, a household name in Greece. When I went over there recently for, for research, I was getting the in, in a cab from the Athens airport and um, the, was talking with the with the cab driver and he sort of, he, he said, to, you know, asked me what I was researching and I was talking to him about it and he was like, yeah, Doxiatis, of course, you know, but why, why are you an Australian person trying to teach me about <laughs> this guy who I definitely know? You fool, um, and and so I sort of, yeah. So he he ended up going on working extensively. Uh, he uh, he within within Greece, he he developed um, entire neighbourhoods in the Middle East, in places like Iraq. Um, he worked in in Syria. He d 
designed a cathedral in Ethiopia, um, but the thing that he's best known for is he he designed the city of Islamabad when Pakistan, new, the newly formed Pakistan, needed a, a capital city. And so he um, is this this incredibly well-known figure within architectural and town planning circles. But this brief period of, of uh, time that he spent in Brisbane is is there's little known about it. Um, and so, you know, through through the project that I've been working on, making work about that time here, I've been able to track down his daughter, who's now in her 70s, um, living in Corfu, and spoke to her about the time uh, that she spent here and, and the, the memories that she had. And, and yeah, at the, at the moment I'm kind of making work about that time, but then also folding that narrative into um, uh, a kind of making some work that that addresses both that story and the Brisbane Expo 88 story as well so and um do you want to just tell us a little bit about um where these works will be realized because I understand they're having um exhibition outcomes shortly right yeah yeah well next year which feels very shortly okay, <laughs> in my, sure. my <laughs> mind at the moment but um yeah so they're they're a few a few different forms one um one work which will yeah, the, the part that kind of addresses the the Expo 88 element will be part of a group show in Sydney next year in um, an exhibition called The National uh, at Carriage Works, and then the the rest of it will will sort of be shown around the same time here in Brisbane, and will kind of incorporate a whole bunch of different things, things like text works that are based on the titles of books, essays, textbooks that he wrote, um, but then the kind of the visual style of which reflects they, that, they're, that they're done in will reflect things like book publishing at the time mm -hmm. books that he published specifically as well as the the you know sort of stylistically you know that that kind of style of publishing more broadly um but then also referencing fruit and vegetable packaging and that kind of you know the the boxes that you sort of see everywhere and so the paintings themselves are done on cardboard and one work where i i um am it's an ongoing thing that i need to do more of, but um, it's where I've taken a book that was the last book that he published, but it was a reworking of his master's thesis that he that he um, wrote in the 30s when he studied was studying in Berlin, and it was about um, ancient Greek settlements and the kind of the the um, scientific in the, the way the sort of the proportions of the human body were were very very influential in the design of um, um, these spaces, and so he kind of fleshed it out and and you know added further illustrations and and expanded on different um, investigations and kind of it was so it was both the first and last book that he published but I've I'm recreating it in watercolor using water from tomatoes that I've grown and juiced and strained and then so kind of wow. this little yeah <laughs> Lot, lots of layers going on there real process yeah awesome well thanks so much for sharing that um, and Alicia, would you like to tell us, because I understand um, you have sort of two layers of your engagement with um, yeah. archives in a sense, so That's tell right. us about both of those. Certainly, well I've got two sides I suppose to how I access archives and, and turn them into something in my practice. So it first started uh, about 2012 where the thought occurred to me that I wanted to see what my ancestor looked like. Um, he's a samurai, I sort of heard bits and pieces of information about him from my grandma. And so I Google imaged him and I actually found portraits of him, which you'll see during the slideshow here. And it was one of the most profound moments as an artist to see some sort of family connection uh, visually and to understand the importance of archives as a resource, but archives as in creating that archive as an artist, like that self-portraiture. So that stemmed immediately a body of work of self-portraiture that was very stylized in the same woodblock kind of print that his image is in. And it's been something that has uh, remained within a lot of the work that I've produced with self-portraits. So you'll see some of the murals um, that are painted in Toowoomba last year as well, still within that style. It's about that con connection to my ancestry and to my history and it really did stem from seeing that image uh, of him firstly. And that point also was quite pivotal in understanding how important it was to research uh, records and 
and really envelop that extra narrative or connection within something visual. So uh, as more and more as I start to do commissions and um, projects and even um, the Museum of Brisbane Residency last year, Ace's here, um, it's about using archives as a stimulus for visual outcome. So a couple of other uh, records that are sliding through of the Brisbane River. So that's of a project that is still currently underway at the moment, producing a, a commission for the West End that's going up on Mary Street. So I can't show you the work in progress, but that's um, a little bit of a snippet of the process, starting with um, archives as a way to connect to place as well. Yeah. I think it's interesting also because um, those of us in the art community know that obviously, um, you know, often we have to do other jobs to support our art practice or our curatorial practice or our writing practice. Um, and so do you want to tell us a little bit about um, your position, which is um, with a, within an archival institution and a little bit about the work that you do there as well? Yeah, sure. So wear many hats, as a lot of artists do. <laughs> um, but it's about getting more people engaged with Queen's Own Records at the archives as well. So uh, it's a very new position that uh, they recognise the need of getting more people to access and engage with records because we spend a lot of time and money managing and keeping and preserving them, but uh, we also need people to engage with them and use them and see the value in them. And uh, not just for matter-of-fact kind of affairs with law and... Um, case work and research, but getting the records interpreted by people as well. So uh, I've been involved in trying to get artists to realise the value in records and uh, using them as a starting point um, to create things visually, but also to use uh, facsimiles of them in their work as well. Yeah. And Lou? Um yeah, we've got some great, actually, right now behind us, we've got some images by um, Lou up there. So um, I know that you've done a few different projects with archives. Um, would you like to talk us through a few of those and um, I guess like the exhibition-based outcomes and maybe, you know, why you sort of started looking in archives to begin with? So I'm not going to talk so much about my own visual practice, but... Um as you were just saying, artists wear many hats and every now and then I like to help out with research and different exhibitions when I can, if I can. Um, and so when I was doing honours, I was working a lot with um, the history of the Australian landscape and the um, Art Australian you know, historical canon. And I was asked to help with some research for the Frontier Imaginaries project. Um, and it's a two, this one in 2016 was a two-part project, so it was across the IMA and the QUT Art Museum. Ryan was actually in the QUT iteration of this IMA, sorry, yeah, in the IMA show. Um, and so my job for this exhibition was to go through the John Oxley online archives and to sort of sift through and unearth some Brisbane real estate maps and housing development maps um, from really the late 1800s through to about the 1930s and 40s. And um, you'll see at some point they'll come up on the screen and they're extremely stylized, hand-sketched, you know, really amazing posters. Um, but I think, you know, what they stand for is really quite violent um, colonial boundaries and borders that are placed over the land and people. And, you know, to my understanding... Um, I think these were included in the exhibition. They weren't actually an artwork by any of the artists that were included in the exhibition. They were chosen by Vivian to go alongside the works in the exhibition. Um, but f yeah, from my understanding, they really highlighted the, um, the boundaries and the lines um, introduced and, and how they section off people and how different activities and politics and privileges occur within these different sections of land that have been mapped out and marked out. Um, so, in one way, it was exciting to see, you know, uh, how the land was transformed. I mean, you'll see the Hill End poster, which will come up, which is actually a development in Holland Park in the early 1900s. And before that, it was a slaughterhouse, the site of a slaughterhouse. Um, and so, you can sort of get an idea of how the Australian landscape has come... Uh, you know, looking through the eras of, of how it's transformed through from the pastoral through to the industrial to the... Um, uh, what am I trying to say? The Suburban. So, yeah, it was a really interesting project and um, I ordered the images online. You know, it's actually quite a simple process. 
Um, once you find all the images, I just had to send off all of the image numbers through to Gavin. I'm not sure if he still works at SLQ, but yeah. And uh, Gavin just sent through the high-res images. You can't access the high-res really on the uh, online search, but you know, you're able to order them and pay for them. Um, and they were included in the exhibition just on one of the walls. Um, and that was something that I found really interesting because I haven't really seen an exhibition where there's been work or information included that hasn't been from any of the artists, but more of a, a curator's sort of intervention and, and seeing how archives can work alongside visual art and if they can benefit each other or inform each other. Yeah, yeah I think that's really interesting. And um, just to talk about myself for a little while, sorry. Um, but a little bit about um, the fellowship, I mean, you know, focusing on, on you guys today, but a little bit about the research that I've been trying to do through this fellowship is like, um, I guess, questioning that role of um, curatorial practice and, you know, are archives a valid um, input in like a contemporary curatorial setting? So I think this exhibition that Lou is talking about is um, like, you know, a very valid example of in here in Brisbane of where that's happening because um, at least from my understanding it is like a little bit of a trend I think um, internationally where curators are you know pulling in archives and it's always interesting to analyze how successfully they um, sort of um, work alongside living artists work and um, yeah that's a conversation. Mm. My impression was that for an audience that isn't a contemporary art audience who isn't you know regularly attending contemporary art events it was sort of you know, they're quite a mundane ma material, something that you can often see in newspapers or you would have seen in newspapers. And I think, you know, it's for me it's sort of... Uh, I felt that it highlighted the lines and the boundaries to people, you know, maybe if you weren't so familiar with the artists who were making the work or the content, you know, it was just another reminder that, yeah, these lines and boundaries exist and they've been placed here. But, I mean, it is a good question. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, I mean, that sounds like a, a really critical layer to that exhibition. So thank you for sharing. Um, and um, Ryan um, has just had a, an amazing series of work um, called Blood Money um, and has recently had a publication that he will tell you about. And I guess, like, um, for you, Ryan, um, like, the archives have been perhaps, like, a difficult thing to navigate and, in a way, you've maybe had to, um, you know, build or, like, your practice in itself is, like, um, building an archive that isn't present. So um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about that and um, this body of work and tell people about the histories you're exploring. Um, that would be great. Yeah, so I, I don't rely on archives uh, as a, a foundation, I, I don't think, um, because I'm looking at stories that don't typically exist in archives or if they do, um, it's like, uh, there's very separate threads that I'm pulling in. Um, so like with the blood money work with the, on the PowerPoint and the banknotes, um, I'm typically a uh, majority of the people I've illustrated, there aren't photographs of them. Um, they're real people um, and a lot of them uh, fought actively against British occupation. Um, so uh, within the Australian uh, history records today, a lot of that's been suppressed or ignored or um, uh, diminished, uh, uh, often purposefully. Um, so really, I guess the uh, archives sort of come in indirectly because um, I have to go... I've been in process of going back and... Um, looking at various different fields to be uh, to lay like an argument or to lay um uh what do you mean kind of to give strength to my argument essentially um so for example one of the first people to um that I illustrated on these works back in 2010 uh, uh Pemboy or Bemboyan uh, he fought against the British for over 12 years in the in the what's now Sydney area, uh, and he was actively actually written out of records um, because it went against the uh, national myths, which we're still very much present today. Um, and so I'm having to go through and like uh, 
talk about his life and the context he's living in um, uh, as part of the visual work. I'm, not sh I'm writing actively about it. Um, and the events and the sort of policies and ideas that are around uh, that he was facing and, and his community was facing, men and women, and um, uh, things like uh, a sort of national denial that smallpox was used in Australia purposefully. Um, so at the time, the British actively used it in the West Indies, actively used it in India, actively used it in the Americas. Uh, Australia was one of the last uh, colonial settlements, outposts of the British, and it was brought here in the typical British form of storing it on the first fleet, and it's logged on the first fleet. Now, there's no actual reason to bring it here <laughs> unless um, you're going to unleash it on a population that isn't immune. Um, so there's things like that, and then I'm looking through different archives to say, okay, well, will it have survived the journey? Because like a lot of people argue, oh, I won't survive the journey, blah, 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 I won't be uh, um, a contagion anymore. Um, but it would, uh, I've looked at uh, virologist testing of it, uh, current uh, virolo uh, virologist testing uh, uh, experimentation with it um, that's been sort of academically, what do you call it, um, verified and peer-reviewed, peer that's what I'm looking for. Um, and it would easily survive. Um, so Pemulwuy was al alive uh, during uh, the outbreak of smallpox, the release of smallpox uh, that diminished Aboriginal populations throughout the East Coast by up to 70%. Um, so another myth I'm sort of having to fight against uh, uh, is the population myth that there was only a few thousand Aboriginal people sort of wandering around. Um, when that wasn't, how could that be true in similar climactic and cultural approaches to the country like um, around the world, there was documented millions of people. So how is it true there's only a few thousand people here? Um, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, so these are things I'm looking at archives for, uh, uh, indirectly supporting the work um, and supporting people like Permoy's efforts uh, uh, in maintaining his society. Um, because despite this huge population loss, he's fighting the British in, in, with hundreds of people uh, confronting these colonial settlements actively, and he's being shot countless times and still uh, proceeding to do it. Um, so, yeah, I sort of look at archives uh, throughout... Uh, academic institutions, because that's the great thing about doing a PhD and finishing that and then doing a postdoctoral study uh, that I'm, I'm sort of following up with this banknote work is um, I'm able to access all these different fields of research uh, to bring in uh, to support uh, what I'm saying. So I'll just do something really corny and um, quickly. So this is my book and... Um, <laughs> And so it's got the essays and, and chapters I'm talking about uh, and like a beautiful sort of documentation of all the works and that. And it's available at the IMA or you can buy one from me tonight. I have a handful uh, and it's $25. Yeah. <laughs> And fresh off the press as well. Fresh off the press. Um, yeah, I mean, I was privileged to... Um, I just happened to be in Melbourne um, for the Melbourne Art Fair where Brian was launching this book down there and that was only, I feel like, a few weeks ago, but maybe longer, I don't know. Mm. Um, but, yeah, definitely fresh. Um, yeah, fantastic. I feel like um, with everything that you guys are saying, you know, there's, there's lots of things going on. There's engaging with um, personal histories... Um, in terms of your own history and, um, you know, and identities, and also engaging in, um, I guess, um, pockets of research that might not necessarily be um, in the homogenous way that we view culture, um, and sort of um, unearthing those to a public as well. Um, I'm wondering, I'm kind of interested in the, the digital space of archives as well, because I feel like... Um, you know, often when we think about archives, and of course here at the State Library it is physical archives and it is so exciting, you know, if you do have the time to sort of um, visit and get the gloves on and go deep into the research. 
Um, but I am, um, on the converse side, also very interested in the um, dissemination of images online and also, I guess, the way that um, artists research and this being like the first point of call sometimes. Um, so I just wanted you guys, you know, um, what has your experience been with this idea of like image circulation um, and perhaps engaging with something that might be archival in nature, but also potentially to have lost that value through being um, in an online space? Does anyone, uh, can anyone like speak Hito to that? Keto should be on this. Um, yeah, if only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's an amazing artist. Um, well, I've looked at the uh, archives digitally um, and I think partly because it was an easy way for me to access um, the information from home, um, where my studio sort of really is and that's where I do a lot of my work from. Um, and I could have gone in in person but I think, you know, so many archives and library books and things are digitised these days that it almost doesn't make sense to waste the time and energy to go in and pick up something physically. Although, you know, there's not there's nothing quite like looking at something firsthand um, and smelling it and seeing it and looking at it. But, um, you know, if it's digital and if it's there and if it takes you two seconds to find it, uh, why not? Yeah. But there is a lot of images um, online. and and But, you know, there wasn't as many real estate maps as I thought that there would be. Um, and you do have to dig a little bit different mm. keywords to find them. Um, but it's a really quite simple way of gaining access and you don't even have to log in, I don't think, to use the OneSearch here at SLQ. You can pretty much just type in whatever you want and you're good to go. Yeah. And to be able to access it you know, at home or from the studio like that beforehand is a good way of kind of sifting through mm. things, that you'd like sifting that you don't have to do on site and you can kind of go straight for what you're interested in. You know, it's sort of, you could figure out what's relevant and what's not, and then by the time you actually arrive, it's kind of, you can go straight in for the kill. <laughs> but it's emailed to you, you know, that's the yeah. thing, yeah. Awesome. I suppose the beauty of having the digital side of things is that you can build your own archive of archives on your hard drive mm -hmm. as well, is that you can build your portfolio of research of images and refer to that, and it is accessible and it's instant as well. Um, but the beauty of the real record is that it's authentic, and I think that's sometimes the danger, especially when you're doing research online, is that sometimes what you're looking at isn't exactly what you think it is. And you can never truly be sure unless you're holding it right in your hands as well. Mm, definitely. I feel like um, there's a few similarities to um, another panel discussion I did earlier this year, which um, Ryan was also a part of, um, which was looking at um, the role of independent publishing and um, this divide between... Um, online printing and publishing. And I do feel like that connection to publication in a way can be um, drawn to archives as well. And quite often it's this binary thing that emerges where, you know, people are really scared that people aren't going to buy physical books anymore, even though you should definitely buy Ryan's. Um, but, you know, a lot of, um, for instance, Australian art publications, I guess, are feeling the pressure of having to um, make that choice between um, engaging with specifically online audi audiences or sort of very stoically um, continuing that press, um, press-based approach, which obviously has like um, pedigree and historical value as well. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's kind of interesting to talk about in terms of art practice. Um, did you guys have any opinions on, on that? Like, have you um, worked in that sort of publishing space? Because, Lou, I know you've um, published writing that's obviously been online as well. Yeah, I have. I've published a couple of essays, or oh, not essays, but reviews on exhibitions um, online through Un, Un Magazine, which is like an independent um, uh, publishing. Like a, I don't know how to explain it, but it's really cool. It's in Melbourne and it's free. You can just pick a copy up, um, and also uh, through Art in Australia through the online platform I've written. And um, but I have to say, like, there's nothing quite like being published in paper and and that circulation that it gets, and someone walking into a cafe and saying, "Oh, hey, I picked up this magazine," and there was something in it, and there's something that seems a bit precarious or uh, instable or insecure about information being online. I mean, even though there's stuff, you know, um, stored in the cloud and wherever else it goes, um, <laughs> you know, th it seems like if you've got it in your hand, then it's it's there. Whereas online, it's sort of intangible, and mm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, the other great thing, obviously, about libraries is that um, they collect these publications as well. So, in a way, uh, inherently, anything that's printed and then, obviously, 
um, donated or collected by the library then becomes, um, one could argue, an archive um, or a printed thing as well. So, um, yeah, that's interesting, I think. Um, and I wonder if the online online um, publications are, are documented in the same way or whether they're just left online to sit. Um, well, I mean, I can speak to that. I used to run um, <laughs> uh, an online publication, I don't even know, like in 2011 called The Maximilian. And I mean, we were, myself and the co-director, Laura Brown, who was um, now is in LA, but was um, a Brisbane-based curator as well. And we were kind of looking at... Um, literally from a budget sense, how do we get writing out there? And that's why we chose the online space. But since that um, activity seizing in the same way that potentially artist run initiatives might have like a limited amount of time of engagement, we've had to deal with this like digital archive and you know, to what end um, do, do we engage with this? Do you keep on paying for the domain name? Do you exactly. get rid of it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, so that's just an interesting little anecdote there, but, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, in all of your works, um, you're really sort of um, bringing about research that people uh, might not be aware about and that's sort of like the core um, value of what you're doing and like really sort of putting it out there and stuff like that. Um, I just, yeah, I wonder if you guys can just talk a little bit more mayb maybe about um, how audiences have responded to some of these works that you've done and how, you know, have, have anyone sort of, you know, have you had any interesting audience engagements in terms of people perhaps being surprised with the information that you're putting out there or, um, you know, maybe having an affinity with that as well? Um, just to go beyond, you know, you putting a work out there, how is it received? How are people, like, being receptive to that space as well? Well, I can talk about uh, the residency that I had at Museum of Brisbane last year <laughs> where... During that time, I was looking at architectural plans of the City Hall, mm -hmm. and that really informed a lot of the visual elements of the works that I created. So I made a uh, paper cutting installation uh, from all the studies that I had done. And if you just looked at the work, you wouldn't have known where it was from. But once I had the chance to explain to people that these patterns and these images were actually from the window panes and the tiles and the floor and the seating pattern of the concert hall and you can go downstairs and have a look at the architectural plans yourself and check it out. It really did spark interest from the people I was talking to. So mm. I found that even though the work became its own entity, with that connection back to its visual stimulus being the plans, it sparked people's curiosity and they wanted to go down and, and have a look for themselves too. And do you want to just explain a little bit about how the Museum of Brisbane Residency works for those that might have not visited? Um, because it is quite um, an interesting space in terms of being um, at once closed off to the public, but also the public can see as well. So maybe um, just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, for the residency that I undertook, I was uh, in a studio space that initially started with people being able to come in and, and watch me work pretty much this kind of distance and there were some bollards in place because I was working with paper, it's quite fragile and people always had the tendency to want to touch things. Uh, but as the days went on during the residency, my work got bigger and bigger and I literally took up the whole space. So we actually had to cordon off the room itself and people could just sort of peer over and watch me working. Um, so that was during the making side of things for the first 10 days or so, but when the work was finished and it was installed, it was in the hallway that leads into the ex exhibition spaces. So at the moment, it's in between the shop, the beautiful new shop front, and then as you go into the, um, the exhibition spaces. So I created a, like an immersive installation with three hanging paper cuts and two long paper cuts mounted onto the wall as well. Yeah. And yeah, poten potentially that site being, um, you know, a really interesting avenue for you to actually have that audience engagement being in the studio, but also having, you know, people sort of come up to you and engage and, and touch, which maybe isn't great, but, you know, um, at least, you know, have that level of engagement as well. Yeah, well, it created conversation. And I think mm. that's, that's part of a residency is uh, if you are there where people are uh, can come in, it's open studio, you sort of become part of the the artwork itself, like you're there to engage and talk to people and get them interested and, 
and answer questions and um, as well as being watched while you work as well. Mm. Yeah. And how about you, Sam? Have you had any uh, doing this research? Because um, I understand um, you've also done some research, which I guess has been more collaborative in terms of like reaching out to specific communities as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, um, my, I guess my like a real interest that I have with the archive um, and sort of something that probably um, um, needs to be addressed more is just how kind of the, the perceived um, kind of authority of the archive yet the actual flaw and and issue with the archive is that it is a series of information as Ryan talked about that it's kind of um, collected in very certain ways and presented in certain ways yet has the perception of openness and kind of transparency um, when actually you know the the reality of the situation is that it's presents certain um, viewpoints and and is limited in in that way and sometimes those viewpoints um, can be really quite problematic one of the interesting things that I um, found with this particularly with this doxiatus work was the the archive that I was accessing was personally the the Constantinos Apostolos Doxiatus um, archives in Athens it was which is now part of the Benaki Museum, but it's not uh, in Athens, but it's not officially part of the Benaki Museum. It, it just uses their um, facilities and their sort of archive, they kind of rent the space. Um, but it's, it's very much um, through, it's very much sort of through his family and his, his um, company that he had, the, you know, all of the, the things that he kept for posterity and the records that they had are there. And so they are, very much um, you know, the the information and the the correspondence that that sort of is part of it, um, they w are presented in a way that he kind of, although not directly in how the archive was assembled, they were very much kind of based on how he kept them, what he decided to include and exclude. Um, when I went there, the the head archivist, um, she was sort of very very um, thorough in kind of asking why I was there, what my what my intentions were and you know I mean I think it was as someone who was involved in the very early days of of Pakistan Doxiatis had a lot of interest that was um you know related to that and so when I came in and was interested in finding the receipts for tomato seeds from the Stones Corner hardware store from 1952 you know she was sort of a little bit perplexed and just at that point was like you do your thing I'll <laughs> see you in a bit you let me know if you need the photocopy serious up. reason <laughs> but, but um um there was there not like a, about maybe a, around the same time that I um, had visited the archives, there was a book that was released that, that um, was written by, I believe, a German author that was very critical of, of Doxiatis and this kind of... He had very much has this this um, image of, uh, you know, as a kind of rock and roll town planner. You know, he, he was this sort of this this personality where he, he um, you know, would, would make these very, very... He talked a lot about... Um, utopias and dystopias and these kind of spoke in these very broad terms that were uh, and had these plans for entire cities that, that were very hard to to actually enact and and you know not not sort of peer-reviewed or you know verified and how you know how um, effective they would have been there I was reading about one just the other day his plan for for Tehran when when Iran kind of had commissioned him and it was just prior to, to his death that he was working on it. So nothing ever happened with it and partly because of his death and partly because of the fact that his solution was abandon Tehran and build new Tehran and just sort of start again, and which is, you know, entirely um, implausible. But so this, this book that was released by this German author was very critical of um, him and kind of spoke about his, his role in Pakistan that was presented at the time as, you know, this this um, European figure who had kind of th worked a lot and thought, you know, thought a lot about ancient civilizations and how that could be, how the ancient could be transposed into the modern, when in reality there's um, a lot of research coming out now about the fact that perhaps he was actually um, put there more directly by US forces, uh, US sort of authorities and US um, um, government officials who, who wanted to exert more control over Pakistan who were at the time were quite worried about um, um, Pakistan's independence and India's independence and then the separation of Pakistan and India and so actually you know there was potentially a more 
malicious element. Um, um, you know, and and so the author of this book had managed to uncover all of these, uh, all of this correspondence between Doxiatis and Pakistani officials, Pakistani generals, U.S. officials, and kind of used these to to mount a case against him. And so there's kind of this interesting um, moment where you know it's no longer no longer um, under the, the you know it, it's the the archive no longer has the ability to dictate how the narrative is framed or presented and it's kind of the you know the the archi archive is is yeah it's um, um, open to interpretation definitely I think um, that story has definitely demonstrated that and um, also I mean become such a vehicle for for your research as well sort of hook, hooking into these um, outrageous histories in a way and sort of un unearthing them and uncovering them as well. Um, how about you, Lou? Like um, maybe, I mean, you don't even have to talk about archives necessarily, but maybe just how, like how has some audience responses to your work been? I'm glad you asked. I was going to say, can I return to that question? Yeah. Um, well, working with mining is like an extremely complex issue, which I'm sure everyone here is aware of. And um, it's complex because on one hand, mining is something that you can very easily critique. But on the other hand, mining is something that everyone in this room, I'm assuming, is complicit with. Um, and unfortunately and disappointingly, it's, I was surprised that people were surprised by how many abandoned mines exist in Queensland. There's currently 17,000 abandoned mines which legally don't have to be remediated or repaired or returned to their natural state. The First Nations owners, they can't do anything to it. They have no legal rights to go in there and do anything. And even so, what would happen? What would they do? And so it's extremely complex. And um, something that I've found really sad about working in mining is, is how much people just don't care, you know, about the earth and the environment. And, and it's funny how removed we are from mining when our lives could not exist as they are without the processes of mining. You know, everyone's going to go home tonight, switch on their lights, everyone's going to flick on the kettle, you know, and all of these things, you know, unless you live in uh, a little shack in the middle of nowhere and have your own solar panels, which also require mining to exist, <laughs> um, it's extremely hard to not be complicit with mining. And I'm not, through my practice, trying to say that mining is bad and it shouldn't happen and that's it. I'm not trying to say it's good and we need it and that's it. I'm just trying to say shit you know like what do we actually do about this because what like we have to do something about it and um the only way for me to be able to communicate this is through my art practice and um so yeah people have been surprised with the figures and numbers because we're not told about it and it's <laughs> not in the media and even if you do even if you are told today there's 70 17 000 abandoned mines like what can we do about it you know, and it is surprising and it is sad, um, but it's it's the way the world is right now and I think people deserve to know the truth about the environment and our and the landscape and stolen land and, um, yeah, people are surprised. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I was definitely not aware of um, those figures and, I mean, I, I think it's such a rich conversation in Queensland in particular, um, acknowledging, you know, perhaps our own position within Australia and... Um, it won't change unless we do, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. Um, and Ryan, I mean, a segue in a way to talking about um, your work. Um, I guess, I am I mean, I was really interested in um, the component of your recent exhibition with the IMA and then also um, down in Melbourne with the currency and how that was circulated and then the audience engagement with that work as well. Because um, you raised a lot of money, which is amazing. Um, could you s tell us a little bit about that and, um, like, for the people in the audience that might not be aware about that work? Um, about the exchange terminal. Exchange terminal. Yes, that would be great. I saw a thing. There's, like, hundreds of our politicians are either directly or historically been actively in mining companies, you know, or are currently, uh, currently the administration as active people within top tier mining companies yeah it's crazy yeah you can you can keep talking about yeah. that if you want <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's fine you guys talk uh, amongst yourselves <laughs> um yeah the cash exchange booth uh is like probably the most fulfilling work i've ever like been awesome. able to make um 
and like uh, I've only been able to make it after like 10 years of of trying to uh, figure this sort of thing out and doing these works over the past eight, nine years. Um, and then uh, having opportunity to first like prototype it, the idea through like leftover sticker sort of prints of the, the works, which are like large scale paintings, but then printed off in the actual size of the banknotes. Um, at, at Tarawara and it doing okay, like getting a few grand. I think it's like 1500 or something. Yeah, that's um, a lot better than okay. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, and um, and then the IMA show come up last year and uh, I really wanted to do it again and, and like, because uh, at Tarawara is just like a little, it's just one of their old cash registers and um, it's just their front desk and had a small budget, like $200, to get a vinyl printed out and slap on their front desk, so <laughs> swish. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, I was lucky, I was lucky uh, uh, to get some funding and stuff because um, living in Logan, that actually classifies as regional as well. Sweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then, so we got it up and going and... Um, yeah, I got fi five, over five grand at IMA, um, which I was like amazed about. Um, I, I didn't think I would get that much, uh, especially because it was cash only. We didn't have FPOS facilities. <laughs> um, and then so all that money was split between um, uh, a community startup, basically, uh, in Alice Springs as a youth centre called The Gap. Um, uh, Aboriginal Youth Centre, and um, it, the gap is like a shitty part of the of the town. Like it's a poor area, and it's where my family uh, from uh, have lived for decades. And um, uh, basically, it's like it is like the uh, transition from fringe dwelling into the the town. Um, anyway, so half went there. Um, because uh, my family had a long connection with that actual centre as well. My, my grandma was named while she passed away. She, the one that they named one of the rooms after her. And um, <coughs> uh, my uncle used to work, uh, work there. And um <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, my dad did <coughs> some work there. And the other half went to... Oh, sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> I can't hold back so much. Um, anyway, so the other half went to uh, Southside Education, with the, which is like a um, independent educational facility um, for uh, uh, girls and young women, sort of, and escaping um, sort of various forms of disadvantage and, and violence and that sort of thing, and for them to be able. To <coughs> Uh, to finish school. So I'm, I'm very passionate about this. Um, and then, so I went down to Melbourne Art Fair and uh, we actually had FPOS facilities. <laughs> uh, so that was good. And a lot of uh, 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 thoroughfare sort of people walking through. And we raised uh, just shy of 10 grand, so... Uh, all that money has gone to these two places. Um, so it, it's one of the ways I'm sort of looking at um, circulating these stories um, uh, and giving some sort of physical life to what are typically I've heard growing up, uh, like oral histories, um, and giving the actual object and the face to the name and um, uh, great awareness as well as um, fundraising, yeah. And so spreading the archive out of the out of the dusty rooms. Yeah. Definitely, and I mean, creating a whole new archive and um, you know spreading this information around and um, uh, you know drawing publics, but then at the same time having 
an extremely meaningful connection to obviously giving back to community as well, which is um, really important and um, an amazing effort. Um, yeah, I'll be in Sydney Festival as well in uh, January, so if you're in Sydney, <laughs> come All visit the steps. booth. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, um, soon um, I will open it up to our lovely audience here for some questions. But before doing so, I wanted to give you guys the chance to ask each other questions. If, you th if there's anything that came up tonight and you wanted to, you know, have a bit of a discussion between each of you, feel free to do that now. You know, I don't want to be um, dictating the whole conversation. So, you know, if you have questions for each other, um, feel free to do so now. Ryan, did you ever think that your uh, practice alone could change so many lives? Uh, I don't want to uh, drum it up too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's just it's def it's the best thing I've been able to do to do with it. Because um, uh, I got like a letter back from Southside, and they just sort of itemized all the things they did with it. And it, was, it was amazing, you know. Um, and it was like thinking about art and its place in 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 our everyday lives, and you know the questions of where the art makes a difference or can make a difference or it can change people's minds or whatever. Um, and so I was thinking about that years ago, and I was like, oh, this is the best thing I can think of to do with what I've put together so far to actually that I can think has some verification where it does do something um, instead of maybe being hypothetical or, um, or, or a hope. Yeah. Um, not that I'm saying art doesn't help people or whatever, but um, it was just I wanted to do so I had an action. Yeah. More, t more tangible results. Yeah, yeah. Well done. That's really amazing. Okay, so uh, no more questions between the artists, I take it. <laughs> um, it's more yeah. of a, a comment, like hearing uh, the stories from my fellow artists up here as well and just thinking about the unspoken power of records and archives and that issue of significance. Like, How do we decide what gets collected and what doesn't? and how that shapes our historical narrative because yeah. sometimes it's what isn't collected that is just as interesting as what's in the archives too. Definitely, and I think, um, you know, that's that's what we all have to try and um, think more critically about and uh, try to, um, you know, engage with our own practices and question about, you know, um, what is the dominant form of media that I'm engaging with in my own practice or, um, in other people's practice and think about how we can potentially involve other histories that might not be, um, you know, happening in the mainstream. Yeah. I think that's one of the great things about working with archives in art is I think artists are sort of allowed a little more space to question and critique things and I think that um, it's a real privilege to be able to look at information and say, actually, nah, <laughs> you know, I don't think that really happened. Like, this is probably, Fake you news. know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, yeah, um, I'm sure there's more questions from the audience. So um, the lovely Chrissy from State Library um, will facilitate some questions here tonight. Um, just acknowledging that the event here tonight is recorded, so letting you guys know that if you do um, say something, it, it's recorded. So hence the microphones and just... Um, uh, it'll here. be archived. <laughs> archived, yeah. <laughs> Forever. Um, but still, please ask some questions. That'd be great. <laughs> did you swap the uh, art notes for real notes? Is that is that the fundraising that you did? Um, uh, how do I put it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we did the. I used the images, printed them on like polymer. Uh, uh, what was it called? Some material, and so like double-sided notes. So it looked like bank notes. And um, you could exchange Australian money. But yeah. what about the infinity note? I didn't, because, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be good, but, uh, <laughs> um, no, the, the, the earlier set, the earlier, the earlier set of the money, I'd just done the denominations. Um, so I, I grew dissatisfied with 
doing denominations because I don't like that that approach because of like obvious ideas of like hierarchy and ranking people and uh, evaluating people as higher up on some sort of scale um, as well as uh, like capitalist uh, ideology where um, there is ideas of uh, yeah, infinite wealth but in practicality you have to have a limited supply to be able to ch choke hold like a resource um, and, and like funnel it out for for return you know what I mean um, whereas like so basically um, uh, like m mining like going taking over an area um, and uh, exploiting it and um, uh, sort of funneling, funneling out whatever you're looking for uh, whereas the infinite ideas which I didn't use for the terminal uh, is looking at um, a more culturally appropriate version of wealth uh, and accumulation um, because uh, my ancestors have been here for over 65,000 years like that's a, like a minimum you know um, and that's just what what the dominant society would admit to, you know, um, and, and even that minimum amount of time, like admission, um, is beyond sort of comprehension in our lifetime. So, um, how do I evaluate that uh, uh, in uh, this system we're using today? So, the infinite is uh, undermining um, the uh, dominant sort of capitalist ideals because infinite credit would fundamentally undermine the system. Um, you have to have a limit and you have to have, for accumulation of wealth, you have to have a um, monopoli mon mon <laughs> monopolization of that um, limited resource. I'm learning things. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I've got one up at the back there. Uh, if all of you could visit one archive or pick the brains of one archivist, what would you pick and why? Anywhere in the world, any time in the world. Who would you want to ask? <laughs> I think, uh, sorry, does it, does it, does it go first? <coughs> I think that uh, I haven't actually visited it and I haven't done enough research, but I think in San Francisco there's a transgender uh, art historical museum which has actually collected and archived a number of personal diaries um, from transgender artists and people um, over the course of the past hundred years. So that's something that I'd like to have a look at. Yeah. Sounds like a funding application. <laughs> Do it. The Vatican Archives. <laughs> <laughs> Find the Nazi gold. Um, I'm looking forward to heading over to Japan at the end of this year and uh, seeing my ancestors' armory in the flesh. That'll be pretty magical. For me. I'll go sand for Vatican first <laughs> and then <laughs> come back. <laughs> oh, I haven't even been to places like Iatsis, which would be great, um, in Canberra. And I think they have even related like linguistics wings and stuff, which I'd be really interested in. Um, yeah, I mean, there's heaps. Of, uh, I can't pick, pick one, really. Can I tell a little anecdote about it? I went to um, the NASA archives in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago to research some JFK things, and the, the, ar the archive there was hilarious because it was it was well it was underground it was in this basement level and this this one guy from nasa was in charge of me and he just kind of he looked so bored and so sad and his job was just to help me and he just looked crushed and he had this like little this lanyard around his neck that with his security pass and when he, he basically informed me that um he had to be with me at every point that I was in the building, so I needed to let him know if I wanted to go to the bathroom because, unfortunately, he would have to be present just in case I did. But he had this <laughs> lanyard around his neck that said, NASA, we have friends in high places, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, but I was working down there, I was sort of like looking at, looking in these sort of files, these photos of Werner von Braun showing Kennedy through the um, uh, NASA, NASA different NASA sites. Um, and 
was kind of just going through and I looked over at the photocopy that I needed to go and use and I saw something just out of the corner of my eye that seemed oddly familiar. I was trying to figure out, I was trying, like, it had this moment where I couldn't realize, I couldn't figure out why it was so familiar. And I realized that it was the 1969 Gold Logie for the most watched television program on Australian television for the moon landing. And it was, (laughs) and it was sitting next to the photocopier. It was incredible. And I definitely could have stolen it. Thanks, it's been great. Um, I, was, I wanted to respond to that question or the comment around how do you determine, how do we determine as collecting institutions what's significant and there is no easy answer. And I think for all of us it's also what's significant today versus what someone in 50 years' time is going to think is significant is our challenge. But one way we do that is through legal deposit. So I'm not sure if everyone's aware, every book published in the state has to be deposited to the State Library of Queensland. So no librarian's bias can come into the conversation and into the process. Everything has to be deposited, whether it's physical or digital. So if you have publications, please deposit them. But it is one of the ways that we do get around that sort of librarian's bias. I was interested if you could tell us, if there was one thing that we could do better in making our archives accessible, what would it be? Including minority information from different minority groups that have been left out for the entirety of history. And which we're working on, obviously, very passionately right now. How would you suggest, Lou, um, you know, how would you sort of bridge that? Is there um, an example that you can give? I think it's the library's responsibility, and I know that it's probably a bit of extra work, but I think it's the library's responsibility as researchers and librarians who are familiar with information and material to actually seek out and research people that are maybe leaders or uh, spokespeople for minority groups in Brisbane, whether that be First Nations people, whether that be queer people, whether that be people of colour. There's a whole range of minorities that just still aren't included and it's not good enough. And I think that that's due to lack of research and lack of people actually putting in the time and effort and the care to make sure that it's done properly. But also it might be even worth like, you know, employing someone at the SLQ in that area whose specific job is to research minority groups and to include that information. You know, I'm sure it's more bureaucratic than just saying, hey, here's your job, go do that. But, like, I think that's extremely important and it needs to happen. We do have an active campaign. The, the issue is, of course, how do you do more and how do we, do, how do we collect material that wasn't collected 30 years ago mm-hmm. that's yeah. potentially disappearing or is in someone's garage? Yeah. But it is an active area that we want to not just collect the easy stuff but to go and find the things, the untold stories, all yeah, those hidden awesome. stories. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I think it's also about like activating these things. So uh, just just to throw my two cents in here, um, because you know there are a lot of um, archives that are present as well. But I think you know, and today in public programs and you know art projects, these are really the opportunities to to bring things out as well. So I think it is actually about activating these histories and and bringing them alive and you know making them public as well. And I, I feel more like talks like this, I think, is really great. Great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. um, but how about the rest of you guys in, in response to that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I echoed that sentiment. That the um, um, the one of the things that I think <coughs> Drew has drawn me to the Doxy artist story. Um, a big part of it has been, you know, his time in Brisbane has been so easy to chart and to uncover because of the fact that this career that he had upon returning to Greece was so, such, you know, such, so well illustrated and so kind of, um, um, you know, he was so prolific and, and achieved a certain level of um, recognition. Whereas if that were not the case, you know, all of these things, the, the Stone's Corner hardware receipt for the tomato seeds would, you know, it would be lost in, um, and you know, even if they were kept for for posterity, they would be in you know someone's his daughter or grandchild's garage, maybe you know. And and so it's kind of it. It made me sort of ve- it made me acutely aware of the fact that that this is one story that, due to you know good fortune, um, was accessible. Whereas you know what stories like that aren't accounted for. And so um, I mean you know it's it's. Um, yeah, I very much echo that that idea. Yeah, awesome. I 
agree with the public programming side of things as well. I think having opportunities like this for people to gather and exchange knowledge and have that dialogue is really important to activate the stories within the archives and the records. Yeah. I don't really have any constructive <laughs> feedback to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I would also just sort of like in that vein continue on that, like maybe also to continue upon that, um, how do you guys think that visual art practices could be um, better supported within um, the library context in Australia? I mean, not just picking on SLQ, but you know, um, you know, libraries are amazing spaces. Um, I'm hugely inspired by um, the architecture here and I love coming here and researching, but I do feel like um, sometimes the visual arts community can have, um, you know, we have our community, uh, we do our stuff, but I feel like there sometimes can be a little bit of disconnect. So I wondered if you guys had any ideas about how visual arts practice could, um, you know, find, find a larger way of being within libraries. I must admit I was, with this particular project, very fortunate um, when I'd kind of found out that a friend's uncle had told me about Doxiatis and his time in Brisbane and he sort of couldn't give me too much specific information. He's like, oh, I think he was working on something. I can't remember what, it, you know, I don't know what it was. So I emailed a, a university lecturer, you know, asking what he was working on and they replied saying, I think you've got the wrong guy. He was never in Brisbane working on anything. You might have been thinking of... A, B or C. And so then it was only because Doxiatis, his son is a well-known author and on his Wikipedia page it says, born Brisbane 1953. And that's kind of, that's, it, so I was like, oh, you know, there we go, confirmation. And um, went to the John Oxley Library and, and through a, with a very helpful um, librarian at the time, we kind of went through and she was sort of asking questions about what I knew and I sort of was like, I've got no idea, he owned a farm in Rochdale, like what? Yeah, and so through, uh, with her, we went through and, and exhausted all these different avenues and came up with courier mail articles about um, him developing certain techniques to, to grow, you know, now common practice, but at the time, not so much where, you know, you would grow the seed in a paper cup um, and then, you know, once it had germinated, you would plant the cup into the ground. And, you know, so he was he was being touted as this, this um, um, you know, engineer who had who had you know hacked the horticulture system or whatever and um, um, but then also we even tracked down the original listing for the real estate listing for the farm in Rochdale and so you know I um, I don't think the SLQ owes me anything at this point <laughs> <laughs> I think I've spent many 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 hours um, sitting in the Asia Pacific Design Library and it is wicked and I love it. And um, I just wonder, like, I know that the Goma Library is so close, so I'm sure that they probably take care of a lot of the um, visual and contemporary art side of, of stuff. But, I mean, if the SLQ had, like, a, a publicly accessible, you know, visual arts library, like how wonderful the Asia-Pacific one is, I mean, it would just be fantastic. And I'm not sure that many people in the public are aware that the Goma Library is accessible or how much is there. Um, I think one of the people that often helps me is sitting in the audience. <laughs> hey, mate, fantastic if you ever need a hand at the Goma Library. Um, <laughs> but I wonder, like, is there a reason that, that there isn't more of a contemporary art section in the library? Is there a reason why it's just design? Does anyone know? It's there. And also that we would take into account the Goma Library and Goma not library. try and duplicate collections as much as we yeah, have to. Yeah. But it's probably, you know, if you use the catalogue, there's a lot of content. It's just not laid out the way um, APDL is. So it might be a bit harder to find sometimes. Yeah. Or in the back rooms, you know, so 80% of the collection's in storage somewhere and you have to request it. Yeah, yeah I guess this is something that I think about a lot because... The Goma Library is amazing and yeah there is so much stuff here that I'm like constantly coming across like there's some weird weird books um, and <laughs> like just physically weird and yeah I just wonder I think about sometimes like how to get artists in the library like is it um, more is it like at university kind of or is it um yeah, like specific kind of, I don't know, instruction in like how 
because like I think some people come across it and then when they come across it they like deep dive into it um do you think like it's actually something that we need to think about more about how I mean you're obviously um is that Alicia you're you're yeah so yeah I guess how are you thinking about that how are you getting people into libraries to use them for artistic purposes like what are the yeah how are you doing that <laughs> I think we're engaging artists as interpreters and it can be a really strategic thing to do when you're in an institution that has to remain impartial and balanced and you can present the facts of certain records and archival um, items um, but they'll always be up for community interpretation and that's something um, that institutions can't always do but you can engage artists to creatively interpret them and take uh, pieces of information or actual physical copies of things from records and, and then recreate that into a work that can be shared so that it creates an opportunity for dialogue as well, like what's actually embedded in this work, where did I get the inspiration from, what records does it relate to, and, and that also provides opportunities for artists to present their work too. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I think um, we might have time for one more question. Any final questions from the audience? I'm, I'm interested in um, how we're collecting your archive, um, and what relationship like State Library and GOMA are represented here. Like, so what, what have we done to actually extend out to you to say how we're collecting your archive? Um, how are we storing your digital footprint? Like I saw a few people's computers there, so... Um, what challenges have you got in actually organising your own archive? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. Not putting, <laughs> not putting um, files into folders and <laughs> having an overwhelming de desktop. <laughs> <laughs> Just folders that say everything. <laughs> <laughs> pretty solid filing system but my problem now is it's getting too big so it comes down to what do we keep in terms of the documentation images and the notes and the research like the visual research that we have when we're keeping pictures of other archival records for those references and things so um, yeah I've gone into the cloud plus I've got a terabyte hard drive but it's still sending me the warnings, you know, on, on, the, on the desktop. <laughs> it's getting too big, um, especially when we've got those handheld devices and we take photos so readily now. So we're just producing that data mm. much quicker as well. And it is an issue that we have to start thinking about how we're going to address that. Yeah. It's got a lot to do with the landscape too, actually. If you think about the internet and um, servers and how much space all the data we're collecting actually takes up in physical space in land, it takes up, you know, so much space just to keep all these pictures in the cloud, which apparently is in the air, but it, no, it's, <laughs> it's on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This might be quite controversial, but I actually like throwing stuff out. <laughs> Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm a bit weird, and I mean I'm not an artist, so I don't have to. I don't have the responsibility responsibility of looking after files in the same way, and I, I wouldn't do it to artist work, of course. Um, but in terms of my own um, research and stuff, sometimes it's actually really nice to throw stuff away and just acknowledge that 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 is, you know, um, that's happened, and then sort of move on as well. So I don't know, um, just to throw something controversial in the mix there. <laughs> Because then it's an interesting question too about what, you know, for particularly for a practicing artist, um, you know, is there a responsibility to show everything, or is it, you know, th there there is an important in you know, the development of work research, you know, it's it's not it's not meant to be a transparent process where everyone is able to to access all of it. You know, there's deliberate um, yeah deliberate steps of showcasing certain things and not others. Yeah, this is reminding me that with these works, um, over time I've changed the way I put them together <coughs> and um, the process that it takes, I've, I've lengthened uh, and made more complicated to get a better final result. 
Um, so that creates all this sort of backlog of um, drafts and redrawings and transparencies and different um, designs. Um, and so I was visiting archives at RBA earlier in the year. And um, uh, it was good because IMA organized it, so it wasn't like, because I'm not a new new numistis, numistis, whatever the word is, um, uh, numismatics, I think that's the thing. Um, uh, they're a bit more cagey about who they let into the actual ar archives because it's in the security lockdown building uh, in uh, um, CBD of Sydney. So I went in there and um, had to get all security code passes and all this and that. And then they take you up to like a glass room and go in this glass, like glass walled room in the center of the office space. And they lock you in there <laughs> and um, provide you with some of the, they hadn't really done their research on, on anything I'd done or who I was. So I was just like, oh, this artist, loser, or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm letting have a look at here. Um, uh, uh, so this institution will stop emailing us. Um, and, um, <laughs> And so they actually supplied me with all the working drafts of the $20 note that's in circulation. And they're like, this is highly classified, blah, blah, blah. Can't take any photos and this and that. Um, and they're watching the whole time in there through the glass, you know. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> we took some notes and stuff and uh, some of the pantones and stuff. Uh, nick some of them so that was good <laughs> and um, uh, but it changed it changed the way i thought about what i was doing in the studio um and how i log the stuff i'm making um and what i historically have treated as just like trash um because it it turned out coincidentally to be almost right on par with what the artists, of course, they employ artists to do the designs of the notes. Mm -hmm. Is what the artists had collaged together in almost the exact same process. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay. And um, with the academic work and stuff, I'm more interested in like writing about the work I've been doing and and um, giving it a more accessible. It's not just like a collector's, you know, uh, the art world is a lot for the wealthy. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just like a collector's game or an institution's game that I can make these books and spread this information. And I mean, just uh, off the top of my head, I can sort of use these images that I had discarded over years for these publications and sort of comparisons and things like that. So it's like coming on to other information and it changing the way you look at your own waste or things you hadn't ha had held a priority for. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I could keep talking all night, um, but I am conscious of time and of, um, uh, you know, the amazing resources that we have here tonight and um, State Library staff. So let's continue the conversation informally. Um, you know, these guys are pretty friendly if you guys want to come down and have a bit of a chat afterwards. Um, but before that, um, I would just like to, um, you know, have a really warm round of applause for the amazing conversation we had tonight. <laughs>